afternoon, and thank you all so much for coming. My name is Alexis Gerganius, and I'm the student president of the Buckley Program. Before I introduce our moderator for today's event, I'd like to say a few words about the Buckley Program. The Buckley Program is dedicated to the, mo to the promotion of intellectual diversity on Yale's campus. We achieve this goal in a number of ways, including our speaker events, debates, annual conference, summer internships for Yale undergraduates, and various other activities. Undergraduates and graduate students interested in learning more about the Buckley Program should visit our website, buckleyprogram.com, to learn more about also becoming a Buckley Fellow. Now to introduce our moderator for today's event. Charles Hill is a diplomat in residence and the Brady Johnson Distinguished Fellow in Grand Strategy here at Yale. A career foreign service officer, Professor Hill was a senior advisor to George Schultz and Henry Kissinger, as well as to Boutros Boutros Ghali, the sixth Secretary General of the United Nations. Throughout his extensive career, Professor Hill also served as Secretary for the Middle East and Chief, Chief of Staff at the State Department, among many other roles. He received his BA from Brown, and he pursued both an MA and JD at the University of Pennsylvania. He has been a fellow at the Harvard University East Asia Research Center, a Clark Fellow at Cornell, and is currently a research fellow at the Hoover Institution. At the end, we'll have time for questions, so please raise your hand and we'll pass you a mic. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor Charles Hill. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, our assigned topic uh, today is Iran, <clears throat> more specifically confronting Iran's rise to a sphere of influence uh, in the Middle East, which is uh, looking ever increasingly to be the central matter of the entire region and beyond that with an influence on the international state system and on world order itself, uh, Iran's uh, emerging sphere seems to be going from uh, the Afghan border across uh, Iran, across Iraq, uh, into Syria, now uh, coming under the uh, renewed control of uh, Assad with Russian intervention help and then into Lebanon with Hezbollah. And uh, thus it's going from uh, South Asia to the Mediterranean, a swath all across uh, the upper Middle East and with a, an arm going down in the Gulf, <coughs> influence in the Shia province of Saudi Arabia and uh, to Yemen. So it's a major <coughs> matter, uh, the tectonic, um, Plates are certainly looking as though they're shifting in the Middle East. Uh, <coughs> the um, recent uh, developments in Saudi Arabia are really surprising and far-reaching. And the Saudi involvement with uh, the resignation of the Prime Minister of Lebanon, uh, we don't know what that means. Perhaps we'll hear that uh, this evening. Uh, but it seems to be something in the realm of the Saudis um, forming the lines for perhaps a confrontation, a Sarkar conf confrontation with Iran. So we have here two of the very most uh, distinguished and knowledgeable people who know about this and can debate, uh, inform us about what uh, they think is really going on. Uh, Brian Katulis is a senior fellow at American Progress, educated at Villanova and Princeton, uh, with a deep experience in the Middle East, uh, work with the National Security Council and with uh, the Department of State and uh, Defense. Uh, that was during the Clinton administration. Uh, he's widely published, widely interviewed, and the co-author of the book, uh, The Prosperity Agenda, uh, which is on national security. Uh, Michael Rubin, a uh, Yale man, uh, resident scholar of the American Enterprise Institute, senior lecturer at the Naval Postgraduate School. He's an advisor on Iran and Iraq uh, to the Office of the Secretary of Defense, the author of uh, many works, um, most recently perhaps, uh, Dancing with the Devil, The Perils of Engaging with Rogue Regimes. So the format we'll try to follow here would be first to have them in turn very briefly for a few minutes each uh, tell you where they generally stand so you can situate uh, yourself and uh, the two of them in your mind. 
and then we'll turn it back to them in turn to elaborate on their position for at some length, and then we'll have time for questions at the end of that. So perhaps uh, start with a short introduction by each one. We'll start with you, Brian. Sure, great. Thank you. And I, and I want to thank the Buckley Program for inviting me to uh, be part of this. The mission of the Buckley Program to promote intellectual di um, uh, diversity is something I'm passionate about. Uh, we've had uh, many, I think, challenges in our universities and in our think tanks. And I've experienced this personally myself, where people want to not listen to the other side uh, and not have an open debate. And I think it's, it's extremely important um, to, to offer this sort of thing. And I recognize that I'm um, at a huge disadvantage here and that my friend Michael has a, not only a home field advantage, <laughs> but uh, this is the William F. Buckley program. And I'm from the Liberal Center for American Progress, right? So in, in the, if, you've, if you follow pro wrestling, uh, right up the street here. I'm, I'm the heel. Uh, I'm the bad guy, potentially, um, um, in this program. Um, and I thought of some things I could say to make you really mad at me. Like, I've never been here before. You know, I've never been to Yale because I went to Princeton. Who, who needed to come to Yale here? Um, <laughs> but um, more, more to the point um, on, on the issue of Iran. And I, Michael and I work closely together, and I've known him uh, many, many years, and I think the first time I met him was in ch early 2003, when he was working at the Pentagon, and we met at a mutual friend's home. Um, we may have met before that, and Michael worked for this administration, the Bush administration, that had a theory of the case about the Iraq War, that it would produce tsunamis of democracy, um, that it would actually uh, yield a new environment that would be better uh, uh, for, for the United States. And it upended a policy of dual containment of both Iran and Iraq, and did something different by invading uh, Iraq and getting rid of Saddam Hussein. And that something different, in my view, uh, ended up to be a passive appeasement of Iran, um, uh, in, in essence, uh, under the Bush administration, and then continued quite a bit under the Obama administration. Uh, Iran saw its influence spread in amazing ways. We got rid of their biggest uh, adversaries in Afghanistan and, and in Iraq, as I mentioned. Um, it spread its influence into Lebanon and to Syria, and it deepened it. Uh, it moved forward in the previous decade with a nuclear program unhindered uh, by diplomacy, unhindered by any meaningful action uh, under the Bush administration, um, and it killed U.S. soldiers in Iraq, uh, and we know this. It, it sponsored Shiite militias and, and, and others that did this. Um, and here we are, uh, 2017. Um, it is far more powerful, uh, and it punches far above its weight than it should. And the key question is, what do we do about it? Um, and I want to offer three ideas about that and then say a few things about the JCPOA in this opening round, and then have Michael respond, um, and, and we'll go to it. Um, number one. Um, we need to, uh, the first thing to, to counter and to deal with Iran's destabilizing actions in the region, the first thing we need to do is defend our partners and our allies uh, in the region. Easier said than done. Um, in some instances, it's quite easy. I just came back from Israel, and Israel, in my view, is one of the few countries in the Middle East uh, that shares both of our interests as well as our values. And in talking with security establishment figures and leading figures in Israel, we're not doing enough actually, uh, to help them defend themselves, especially when they look at what's happening in Syria and Iran's growing influence in Syria. It's harder, I think, to really define what we do with our, our friends in the Gulf states, in Saudi Arabia, and we'll get into it, I think, in the Q&A. Um, they don't share our values. They share a lot of our common interests, but there are things that we can do to help uh, countries like Israel, like Saudi Arabia, defend themselves from things like the missile attack that we saw in Riyadh uh, this weekend. Integrated missile defense systems, efforts to actually make sure that the sea lanes uh, are open. We do a lot of this, but we're not doing enough of it to counter Iran's influence and, and defend uh, uh, our allies. The second thing I think we need to do is deter Iran's actions. Um, and some of our partners do this, but we're not doing enough of this. Cutting off Iran's financing of dangerous terrorist organizations that destabilize countries like Lebanon, uh, that destabilize uh, places like the Palestinian territories. 
um, interdicting shipments of missiles and weapons to places like Bahrain, uh, into Yemen, and things like this. Again, we've seen a lot of rhetoric from multiple presidents uh, to say that do this, uh, um, and we see it recently with uh, President Trump's uh, speech last week, but it has not been done uh, effectively. And then lastly, uh, I'll close on this before we get to the JCPOA, is that we're not doing it anything at all to compete with Iran's influence um, in key regions and in key countries. Lebanon is case in point, and I think our partners also aren't doing a good job. What we saw this past weekend with uh, 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 Saad Hariri's resignation in Riyadh was in essence our partners taking their ball and going home and not and seeding the field, which they've been doing in Lebanon for a long time. That the power, the, you know, the real fundamental challenge of countering Iran's influence in the region is deeply political, it's economic, and it's ideological. And we're not even showing up. We haven't been for decades. And uh, there are many things that I think Michael and I may agree on uh, that, we, that we can do in places like Lebanon and Iraq. First of all, we should call out uh, the malign activities of Iran in places uh, like those two countries. Um, uh, we should actually take them down ideologically um, and support alternatives. And when we were in Lebanon, and Michael and I actually have been to so many countries uh, this year alone in the Middle East, we were in Lebanon in May um, for a joint project our two institutions are doing. Um, there are so many things that aren't being done to uh, name and shame actors like Hezbollah that are supported uh, by Iran. And my worry is, uh, with this new administration, and I have a lot of problems with the President Trump, but I think a fundamental risk that we have right now is this huge gap between his rhetoric, as we saw in the speech last week, and the actual actions we're, we're going to take and that we're willing to take um, in the Middle East. And in my view, I'm not calling for war uh, with Iran or direct conventional military conflict. I'm talking about ideological and political combat in places like Lebanon. Um, and I don't think we're poised to do this. And I'll close with just a few things on the, the Iran nuclear deal and JCPOA, which I supported and I thought was the best of a number of bad alternatives. The way I see the United States and President Trump and his move to decertify the deal is not just a tactical issue of simply kicking it to Congress. It actually has many risks for U.S. influence on this issue of Iran's uh, power in the region, on this issue of whether Iran uh, uh, does or does not get a nuclear weapon. I see President Trump's steps, his speech last week, again, not having a clear plan of potentially isolating the United States in the world, of European partners, of Russia, which just signed a, a number of oil deals with Tehran last week, of China basically ignoring us. Uh, what President Trump framed as an attempt to get more leverage in a negotiation is actually going to likely make America less influential and powerful. Secondly, as we've seen on multiple fronts, President Trump is a bad negotiator. He can't even negotiate with uh, the Republican-led Congress to get a lot of things that he wants to get done. And the early returns on his Asia trip aren't looking great. Um, they're not looking positive at all. So any notion that we can actually renegotiate this deal um, um, in the way that I think he's submitted uh, seems farcical to me. And then lastly, back to the region, I actually feel like this gambit, this, this effort to shake things up and try to get a better deal um, at this moment, um, actually distracts from this broader effort of trying to counter and compete with Iran's influence in the region. That a number of our partners and allies, um, and, and in my travels, and including to Israel uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, they may not be happy with the deal. They don't see it as perfect. But what they see as the big gap coming from the United States is no effort at all to counter Iran in the region. And that's where I think I hope we can have uh, a bit of a discussion and debate here tonight of what are the things that we can do short of direct military conflict that actually takes the regime down uh, a peg or two uh, across the region. Hey, first of all, I'd like to start out by thanking the William Buckley program as well. It's always a pleasure to be back. I, I'd object a little to the idea that I'm on a home field because as an undergraduate, I was actually a group four major. And well, all I would have to say is I got a D in organic chemistry. And if you get a D in organic chemistry, you can be where I am today. <laughs> and this is actually my first time back in Lindsley Chittenden Hall since English 129 when I swore I would never come back to LC. And and so be it. At any rate, I do also want to say that um, both Brian and I are at think tanks, competing think tanks in Washington, D.C.
And one of the drawbacks, and I'm sure Brian can attest to this, when you're in a think tank, is whenever you're under deadline, whenever you have to get that book chapter in, that translation done, that op-ed done, invariably that's when you get called and you have to go to Fox News if you're me or MSNBC if you're Brian and give that 17 seconds of wisdom about Iran or Afghanistan. And I was doing this once recently at Fox News and I came back to the green room afterwards uh, and there was a governor there with a whole entourage who the governor was going to be talking about health care or something. And one of the governors today said, you know, you look good up there. And I said, that's kind of funny because my wife had just texted me and said, Michael, I thought you looked fat, bald, and mean. <laughs> and the governor looked up from his notes and said, no, nah, I didn't think you looked mean. The, the point of that is no matter how mean I may or may not look, feel free to, we, I mean, really, both Brian and I talk at a lot of universities, and what we really live for is the back and forth during the Q&A because we certainly get sick and tired of talking to each other as much as we do. At any rate, um, I differ from Brian on a few issues with regard to Iran. First, <laughs> thank you. Uh, that's the, the first, only time anyone's ever said that. But even, <laughs> even my, daughter, my daughter has a crush on Brian's son and on Brian. But, oh. <laughs> but what, what I would say is where I think we get Iran wrong let me start there, is the United States has a tendency to want to interpret problems in the region through the lens of grievance. And if we see everything through the lens of grievance, that can be comforting because then you can come up with a diplomatic formula to resolve that grievance. But when we look at a country like Iran, too often we mirror image. Look, Multiculturalism, I, I spent 14 years in a Quaker school and then nine years at Yale. And so it was drilled into me that multiculturalism, it's about appreciating each other's differences. But it's not about going into a sushi restaurant and being able to order a mojito. Fundamentally, it's about recognizing that different people and different regimes can think and interpret in very, very different ways. What we, where we go wrong is, is understanding. It, I've got no problem with the Iranian people. Granted, when I was doing my PhD here and I, I was working on Iranian studies with Abbas Aminat, um, I, I went to Iran for my field work and archival work. They used to call me Pasadi Shaitani Bozorg, which in Persian means son of the great Satan. But generally speaking, the Iranian people were lovely. But it's the guys with the guns that matter and it's the ideology of the guys with the guns that matter. And when you look at both the Iranian constitution and more importantly, the founding statutes of the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, it makes export of revolution one of the key causes, um, reasons to be, of the Islamic Republic of Iran. Now, what does export of revolution mean? Back in 2008, there was a debate inside Iran just about what this meant, because sometimes I think, um, figuratively, you've got all these policymakers in Iran driving around with bumper stickers, WWKD, what would Khomeini do? Because they're always trying to put this in the context of, well, Khomeini said this, that's the founding father, Khomeini meant that. And the former president, who many people labeled a reformist, Mohammad Khatami, said, when Khomeini talked about export of revolution, what he meant is we should build ourselves into basically a soft power mecca and make everyone want to model themselves after our system. It's a superior system. But he was shouted down after about three weeks by um, Ayatollah Shahrudi, who is basically, uh, used to be the head of the judiciary, is very, very close to the supreme leader, and the Revolutionary Guards, who basically said, no, when we talk about export of revolution, what we mean is supporting insurgencies by means of bombs and bullets. Now, this debate was more or less shut down when they said if Khatami continued to do this, he would be thrown in prison. And today, when it comes to export of revolution, it's solely about this notion of exporting revolution. Now, it's also a mistake to think about Iran as we go into its influence, just in terms of being a Shiite power. Because when we talk about the Sunnis and the Shiites and the split between them, the Shi I mean, and oftentimes it's explained, oh, the Shiites split off from the Sunnis. Well, let me assure you, when you're sitting in Iran, you don't hear that the Shiites split off from the Sunnis. You hear that we are the, the true Muslims. And even if others have gone awry, we are the protectors of all Islam. And this is one of the reasons why, for example, under Mohammed Morsi and his one year in power in Egypt, 
you had the Iranians establish relations that cross uh, the sectarian boundaries. Now, when it comes to this notion, yes, I think we need to empower and reach out to the Iranian people. But when it comes to the military, what worries me is this. First of all, I've seen an expansion over the last uh, 10 years or so in how the Iranian military rhetoric works. Iran used to describe itself as a regional power. Then it began describing itself as a pan-regional power, by which they meant the Persian Gulf and the northern Indian Ocean. And now, or actually since around 2013, they've been regularly describing themselves as having the strategic boundaries of the Gulf of Aden and also the Eastern Mediterranean. Now, that doesn't mean ordinary Iranians love this. You've had teacher unions in Tehran who have marched under the banners, forget about Lebanon and think about our salaries. But it's still a problem, and we have to confront that problem. Now, wars in the Middle East aren't caused by oil, and they're not caused by a scarcity of water. Fundamentally, they're caused by overconfidence. And what worries me is when we look at Iran, and we look at, for example, former Defense Secretary Chuck Hagel's instructions in the regions to de-escalate the Persian Gulf, if confronted, back off. Or if we look at some of our regional allies who complained in the rush to reach the deal, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, they would give intelligence to American partners about ships carrying illicit Iranian weaponry that needed to be interdicted. And the United States wouldn't interdict those ships for, out of fear of, I mean, basically, the United States didn't want evidence to exist which would get in the way of negotiations. That leads to a, um, over, a dangerous overconfidence on the part of Iran. I'm not worried about the United States precipitating a war with the Islamic Republic of Iran. What I'm worried about is accidentally stumbling into one. Now, when it comes to the Joint Conference of Plan of Action, um, as much as Brian supported it, I, I opposed it. This is one of our differences. And one of the reasons why I opposed it is because I see it setting back the cause of nuclear nonproliferation, not just inside Iran, but outside. When you think about all the other states which have backed away from nuclear weapons, when the Soviet Union collapsed, Kazakhstan, Belarus, and Ukraine. Then in 1991, South Africa. They decided they want to walk away from their covert program. They went to the International Atomic Energy Agency. The IAEA said, you have to come clean in your past 20 years of your nuclear work even with a fully compliant South African government, it took 19 years for South Africa to be given a clean bill of health. They were only certified clean in 2010. And then more recently in 2003, this is why I got a D in organic chemistry, 2010 more recently, <laughs> 2000. at any rate, you had the issue of Libya in which the requirement was the physical dismantling of Libya's nuclear program. So I see a lot of flaws. I have a piece in the Washington Examiner today in which one of the flaws, and this, this isn't just with regard to the nuclear deal, we still in Washington have such tunnel vision and we compartmentalize everything. It's okay to say, okay, let's have a deal where we have inspections inside Iran. But what if Iran is working on its nuclear weapons design and mathematical modeling in North Korea? How then do you address that problem? And it's one of the holes which even very conservative senators like Tom Cotton aren't dealing with. My fear with nuclear weapons in Iran, should they get them, isn't that they're, sui isn't that they're suicidal. What I worry more about, and this is the case in Pakistan as well, is what if they become terminally ill? If President Trump wins a second term, or after the first term of whoever comes after, if he doesn't win re-election, we're going to be dealing with the sunset clauses on this nuclear deal starting to, to um, to expire. And that's going to leave Iran with an industrial size scale nuclear program. Now, Osama bin Laden said, and I'm concluding here, that everyone loves the strong horse. And in this, Osama bin Laden was right. Strength matters. At the same time, Brian just came back from Israel. While Brian was in Israel, I was in Iraq, and I was talking to a very senior Iraqi official who basically said, and I think he's right, if you're not present, you can't have influence. You gotta be here in order to have influence. Now the issue is going forward, Brian and I may disagree on some of the policy prescriptions, but we do believe in a robust and coherent
American strategy to be present. Otherwise, it's natural that people are going to start deferring to those who pretend to be strong, such as Iran, Russia, or China. And in a case like this, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. How we can confront this ideology and project power so that we don't have to use that power is really, I think, the key to resolving the conflict. Uh, thank you. Um, as we'll shift to having um, sessions for of each for rebuttals, reclamas, uh, elaboration, I would like to put a question forward that perhaps each could address. And this comes um, out of the well, my time at the United Nations, particularly although I was aware of it before this, that the modern um, structure of world order is that of the international system of states. And when the First World War was over, uh, the collapse of the Ottoman Empire, the collapse of the Ottoman Caliphate, it turned out seemingly almost by necessity that in the entirety of the Middle East was brought into either directly, immediately, or by a mandate system into the international system of states so that every territory, every people in the Middle East coming out of World War I eventually was going to be in this established system. There was going to be a state authority with borders, with sovereignty, all across the entire region. And this then would come into the United Nations. The United Nations uh, regards itself, it describes itself as the world organization of its member states. It recognizes states as the fundamental unit of world affairs. It recognizes regional organizations such as the Arab League of States, in its name, as the entities <coughs> of world order. Now, since uh, this new century comes into being, and with the Arab Spring and its collapse, uh, in the last few years, there has grown up the assumption that this system of states in the region is finished. And I saw a piece uh, today in one of the magazines uh, that said it has already collapsed. That would mean that Saudi Arabia is no longer really a state, nor is Jordan, nor is Lebanon, nor the Gulf states. I don't think that's happened. I think it's not it has not yet collapsed. But what we're seeing with the sphere of influence of Iran is the rise of a new form of, well, the sphere of influence is what really World War II was fought about uh, in, the, um, in Asia, the greater East Asia co-prosperity sphere run from Tokyo by Imperial Japan. So the stakes here, and this is my question really, the stakes appear to be very high in that if Iran is putting forward a new model, which is neo-imperialist, it's trans-state going from the Afghan border to the Mediterranean, and if the Saudis may respond to this in their own way with <coughs> some kind of coalition, Sunni coalition, uh, are we not seeing, and if you then put this in the context of China today and Russia today who are doing something similar in designing and beginning to carry out a sphere of influence beyond the borders of their traditional state. What does this mean for world order in general? And more specifically, what does it mean for Israel, the state of Israel, which has had a grand strategy since its modern founding of being recognized legitimately as a state in the international system and underlying this is the so-called peace process which has been pointing toward the creation of a two-state solution between the Israelis and Palestinians. Is this not something that can be pulling the rug out of the entirety of recent modern diplomacy and security? That's a lot to unpack, and I think very smart uh, uh, questions. And I often start uh, talks about what's going on in the broader Middle East with a poem. Um, and it goes, Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. 
Um, and I do think that if the state system has not yet collapsed, it has uh, seen enormous strains and I think in fact has collapsed in places like Syria, Yemen, Libya, parts of Iraq, and it's collapsed for a number of reasons. And we've written about this um, in this report. I actually forgot I was going to do this as well. I was looking in my bag, and uh, sometimes things between Michael and I get really heated. So I brought the, the boxing gloves uh, just in case if we, if, we, if we go there. I prefer to go bare knuckles. <laughs> Um, but, but, but the collapse of, I think, the state system in the Middle East, or the strains, and I'm going to take it back to the global question that you ask, um, Professor, because I think it's the real uh, important one. And, and I, I do think we're in a different era, and I think we've been in a different global era since 2012 or 2013, where the rise of authoritarian states that are more assertive in asserting their own ideologies and trying to press back against open democracies, whether it be Russia, in Ukraine and Crimea, or China in, in what we, we see they're doing, or, or, or Iran for the last uh, several years, and trying to push a different worldview has fundamentally strained uh, the state system in the Middle East. I think in the Middle East, there's a number of factors that actually have contributed to the mess that we see today. Number one is this crisis of political legitimacy within states, that there are key sectors of populations in key countries that don't simply recognize the states that had existed, the governments that were there. This is why you see civil wars that are quite vicious, uh, like Syria. This is why you see uh, the conflict in Yemen, which is devastating. It's internal, it's different factions fighting for power, and that's one factor. I think the second factor, which we write about in this report, is this uh, uh, contest for influence and power, uh, Professor, that you talk about. And it's not just what Iran is doing. Uh, Iran has been, I think, the most successful in the last uh, 10 or 15 years, uh, but it's what a number of other uh, countries and powers in the region, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, and others are doing. And I've called it you know, this um, uh, multifaceted and then multipolar uh, contest for power. Uh, multifaceted, why? It's not simply just about military. Uh, and, and conventional armies crossing borders, um, or security support to proxies like terrorist organizations or non-state actors. It is aggressive media campaigns, and you see this in the regional media uh, that has exploded in, in our adult lifetimes, where uh, the counter narratives uh, that are trying to appeal to broad populations. It is um, it, within the region. It is, it is financial. You see sort of uh, the fights over oil and the price of oil and things like this, and then the use of money um, by different countries in uh, parts of the region. And it's a complicated fight, but the basic story is this, is that those countries like Iran, like Saudi Arabia, that have more resources, that have fewer internal divisions, at least till now, uh, tend to project that power through those countries that are, are weaker, uh, poorer, and more divided. And it's putting a fundamental strain, I think, um, on the state system. What has the U.S. Do done about this? We've adopted largely a counterterrorism approach because as uh, state systems have collapsed, as leaders are not seen as legitimate, terrorist organizations of different stripes have actually filled the gap. And we saw this in the episode recently with Daesh, which is, I think, coming to a close in parts of Iraq and Syria. But it doesn't actually, in what we've done in defeating these terrorist groups, it doesn't actually fundamentally address the, the core challenge, which is one that is deeply political and requires, I think, some sort of negotiation over uh, uh, the settlement to these conflicts. And I'll, I'll close with sort of two thoughts and turn it to Michael. Uh, when you look at the crisis, for instance, in Syria and the ongoing war, I, I submit that that has been so devastating uh, to not only just U.S. interests, but global interests overall. And America's passivity, uh, first under President Obama and now uh, under uh, President Trump, has been devastating. Uh, and not only from a humanitarian standpoint, but in terms of the flows of refugees and the impact it has had on open democratic systems and the debates that we've seen in places like Europe and in our own country. This rise of us versus them identity politics um, in part, I think, is a consequence of people seeing chaos spilling out of places like Syria. And I remember four or five years ago, some of my friends writing strategies about containing the crisis of Syria and saying, we have no interest in Syria. And I thought those were fundamentally wrong. Um, I, I think they're also wrong when people say we shouldn't do much more in Yemen. There's not much uh, that we can do there because these things don't stay where they're at. 
So the, the first point I would say is that I don't know if there's any way that we could um, do what uh, in, in the Humpty Dumpty, try to put it all back together again. I'm going to Milwaukee tomorrow and there's, there's a place where you go through the security at the airport and it, it's a recombobulation area uh, where things are brought back together, where you br bring stuff into your pockets and things like this. This needs to happen and I think is happening in some fashion in parts of Iraq and it needs to happen on its own terms. The U.S. has some sort of role in that. Um, but I, I would stress that we need to fight for more conflict resolution and using all of the tools of our power and showing up in places like Syria, which we're simply not. We're allowing countries like Russia and Iran to set the terms of that. To the more bigger picture global point, um, Professor, that you raise, uh, we are in a different era. And I started uh, this, in, I, think, I think, since 2013, where states are trying to challenge uh, the order that was led by open and democratic uh, states in the United States, and we've lost our own confidence to project uh, in any meaningful way. And it's not a left or a right thing. I think we have turned inward, and we don't understand the stakes right now. That if in the Cold War it was democracy and capitalism versus communism, we're in a different era where we're facing different types of models, as you indicate, and we're not reacting in any coherent uh, and organized way. We've allowed outside countries uh, and powers to infiltrate our own democratic systems and get into our heads and divide us. And unless we actually figure out some sort of way uh, to bring it together and talk about how do we compete against these more assertive and aggressive authoritarian powers and what they're doing to the state system, um, either in places like the Middle East or more broadly uh, uh, across the world, uh, I think we're going to continue on this cycle, as we've seen for the last two or three years in this country, of turning more inward. Not isolationism, but retrenchment. Uh, not, uh, not really, you know, it, what we see in the formula of Trump, projecting a lot of uh, a rhetorical strength, but not doing much meaningfully uh, uh, to show up in these places, as, as Michael would say. Hey, I'm going to attack this question in a slightly different way. Um, Basically, I would argue the more things change, the more they stay the same. Certainly, um, a great Princeton professor who is now 101 years old in five months, Bernard Lewis, observed rightly, when you look at the map of the Middle East and you see a straight line, that's an artificial border. Now, across the region, there's lots of artificial borders, but they're not necessarily arbitrary borders simply because most of the population lived along rivers or, I mean, the Nile River, the Tigris and the Euphrates, or lived along the coast. And so it didn't really matter where in the desert you drew the line. That said, we can agree that there are artificial countries, many of the Arab states. But when you look at a map, Iran isn't an artificial country. Iran is one of the few countries on Earth that has a near contiguous history going back 2,000 years. Now, when I was doing um, my PhD in history here, and the Iranian studies crowd would go out uh, to Naples on a Thursday night sometimes. I'm not sure if Naples still exists. At any rate, we would try to go backwards um, from the current leader of Iran, Ali Khamenei, to see who could go back 2,000 years. Ali Khamenei, Rahullah Khomeini, Mohammad Reza Shah, Reza Shah, um, Ahmed Shah, Muhammad Ali Shah, Musa. Believe it or not, none of us got married till we were in our 30s. At any rate, <laughs> it wasn't as cool as we thought it was. At, at, any rate, at any rate, the point of this is Iran has always had a sense of near abroad, a sense of a sphere of influence that was based on its imperial past. This actually predates the 1979 Islamic Revolution. So in this case, and it's one of those issues that drives other peoples in the region nuts, is this Iranian arrog um, state arrogance, a uh, sense of superiority to all the peoples around them. And we see this not only in some of the reactions now and the statements that come out of Iran, but we also see this if we go back to 15th, 16th, 17th, 17th century literature, where the Iranians are comparing the Uzbeks to um, uh, saying they're a culturalist people with a propensity to argue, and they call the Russians European Uzbeks and so forth. Uh, now, so I would argue that when it comes to the sense of sphere of influence, that's not new. When it comes to the breakdown of the state system, I'd also argue, while it's particularly bad at this point in time, it's also not particularly new. When I was in Yemen back in 1995, I went, true story, I, I was studying Arabic in Yemen because that's what one did at the time. 
and I drove 40 miles outside into the desert to a town called Jahana, which was an arms market, and it was outside of government control. Well, I had never, I grew up in Philly. I had never held a weapon, let alone fired a weapon, so I figured I would rent an RPG and, and a Kalashnikov and start out. And it was summer, I was already starting to go bald, so I had a kafia on. A British friend of mine who's now in Parliament, so I won't mention his name, um, said, for atmosphere's sake, put a cigarette in your mouth and I'll take your picture. Well, I was back in, I mean, this was in the age of slide film. And so I gave all the film to my parents. I was back in the university here studying uh, in grad school. And I got this panic phone call from my mom saying, Michael, we developed your film. Yes, mom. Michael, there's all these pictures of you in an arms market. Yes, mom. Michael, you smoke? <laughs> now, but the, the point of this is you've always had sort of ungoverned spaces in the region. Now, after the rise of al-Qaeda, this has become more important. From a policy issue, I would argue that when it comes to national security, one of the biggest differences between left and right is that the left tends to demonize power, while the right sees that power can be used for good or bad. It's one of the reasons why we always hear speaking truth to power as if power is necessarily bad. I mean, I'm taking this from my Quaker school experience, when I would argue power isn't necessarily bad. Now, President Obama tend to, tended to look at the US ability to project force anywhere in the world as an arrow in our quiver in which to engage in wars of choice. And he sought purposely to constrain that ability. He thought it had been misused. And he sought to constrain that ability not only during his own presidency, but into the future, figuring that perhaps the forces of altruism would fill that vacuum. I would argue that American ability to project power is the finger in the dike preventing a deluge of chaos and when you get that deluge of chaos, you don't get the United Nations filling the vacuum productively. You get Russia, you get China, you get Iran. And so part of the problem I see right now is a retraction of the United States from the global stage. And that doesn't necessarily just mean military. I think Brian and I would agree that, um, and perhaps Professor Hill as well, when it comes to the kneecapping of diplomacy and American diplomacy, this is also a major problem in being able to project American power and the American brand throughout the region. Now, lastly, I would argue, actually, I just forgot what I was going to argue. But, but let me, can okay. I interject? Because yeah. I actually think this caricature that Michael has presented of left versus right on power, uh, we need to challenge it. And okay. we can talk about it here, but then also for beers later and things like this, is that I, I actually feel like um, it's a bit of a hackneyed argument that was used at certain moments under the Obama administration. And it ignores a, a sort of a proud bipartisan tradition that recognizes that US uh, military and power beyond all of that, economic power, is important in, in the world. And it goes back to FDR who, uh, and Truman, and, and it stretch, stretches through the Cold War, I think. And where, where I think we've seen a lot of confusion emerge uh, is in the last 25 years in the post-Cold War era. And it's not a left or right thing, because you see the isolationist or retrenchment voices on the left and the right. And we have one in the Oval Office, I think, despite the rhetoric. But in fact, uh, there is this banner called America First. Um, and, and, and what I think has been lost uh, isn't this sort of the left doesn't like power and the right uh, loves it, though we saw in the previous decade what George W. Bush did with the traditional sources of power, uh, shock and awe and overreaches that actually undermined the source, uh, sources of power and the ability for America to actually have an appetite uh, to stay engaged in the, wor in the world. Um, but you know, the, the, the broader point I would say is that I think at this moment in 2017, um, this, this notion of uh, whether the left or the right or, or conservatives or liberals find power uh, more meaningful in the world is, is almost the wrong debate. Um, it's the debate maybe people wanted to have and should have had in 2012 or 13 or 14. Uh, the real debate is, does America actually care <laughs> to stay engaged in, in a lot of, and, 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 and let me say one more thing uh, related uh, why don't you respond, because we're on a flow here on this okay. particular, okay. yeah. What, what I would say is don't conflate left and right with party. Uh -huh. Because the, I mean, both parties in many ways are off their traditional hinges and frankly the traditional consensus that existed. So I'll buy into what you're saying from FDR through Ronald Reagan, even Bill Clinton. Now, what I would argue, and I would, t I would take your point on the 
the isolationism of the fringe right as well as of, of the fringe left. I would also take your point that we need to have a national consensus that national security again is being used as a political football and that so many Americans don't, in Congress even, don't understand the importance of having a coherent strategy moving forward. That said, I do think when it comes to internationalism, multilateralism versus the, the very concrete ability of the United States to project force in the Persian Gulf, in the Pacific Ocean, and elsewhere, he is becoming a key partisan, um, actually not partisan, left-right divide. I don't know, because I, I mean, I just gave an interview at the Cato Institute, right? And they're libertarian on the right. And the, the traditional categories uh, that used to guide the foreign policy debate of neocons or liberal internationalists, liberal interventionists, they're meaningless now. Uh, the, the Republican Party has collapsed, mm -hmm. um, and you saw it on full display in the uh, primary fight in 2015-2016, uh, and the fact that Donald Trump, which who was all over the map, um, and still to this day is not really fit into any sort of category. The left has a similar problem, I think, when it comes to internationalism that is masked by the need to resist and react uh, uh, to a lot of things. So we are in a fundamentally different moment right now, and I don't think actually it is left-right anymore. But let me w say one other thing back to the Middle East and the professor's question on this, the collapse of, or potential collapse of the state structure. In February, I was in Saudi Arabia, um, and I was actually with um, my boss. Uh, Michael's boss, Daniel it, Pletka. It was shorts and t-shirts at the office And, all and I week. asked this question to Mohammed bin Salman. Um, we had a two and a half hour long meeting. He's, he's the new kid in town, the boy prince wonder, um, um, and the crown prince now, who was behind, I think, a lot of the events this past weekend, as you see in the news reporting. And I asked him uh, one key question, and it's something I've asked Saudi officials and others in the region, and I've written a lot on Saudi uh, uh, policy. I said, what, what do you want to actually achieve? What is your strategic goal in the region, in your foreign policy projection in the region? And he said, I want to re-strengthen the state system. And he had said this before, uh, when I met him uh, about a year and a half before, in 2015. Um, he had said, I want to strengthen the uh, state system. In 2017, I asked, how's that working out for you? If you look at events in Yemen and the projection of, of, of Saudi power in places uh, around the region, it, I would argue that that was a bad return on investment. It's led to the cl collapse of state structures. Yeah, sorry. Right, no, no, I, I largely agree. Can I insert one thing? Yeah. Okay, I mean, one of the dynamics, and this is where I'll circle back towards some, some agreement, is what I see is a dynamic as people talk about stre um, strengthening state systems that I see in Iran, I see in Russia, and I think is going to happen in China as well. And that is when you have a stagnation, whether it's a social stagnation or whether it's an economic stagnation, people want to revive the state by rallying people around the flag. And therefore, for example, in Russia, people in Russia, and my wife is a Jackson Vanek baby, um, came to the United States as a result of the Jackson Vanek Amendment, Soviet refugee. And, and so she is a native Russian speaker. People inside Russia were referring to Vladimir Putin as the second coming of Leonid Brezhnev. So what does Vladimir Putin do? Though, do? He invades Georgia. Now that's what makes the headlines here, but then when he creates these puppet states, you have to subsidize them. And that makes the economic difficulty worse. So what does he do? He invades the Ukraine. And then he has to subsidize it, and he's getting caught in a cold conflict, and that speeds up the cycle. When Iran gets stuck in Lebanon, and according to Tasnim, which is an Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps news portal, as of May 2016, they had already lost 1,000 people, which means the, the real number's probably broader. That just makes them more aggressive in order to rally more people around the flag. China, for all we talk about the rise of China, I think that in your immediate lifetime, what the biggest crisis is going to be is the fall of China, the decline of China, especially when we look at the demographic precipice that's caused by the legacy of the one-child policy. What happens if China has a leader like Vladimir Putin? And when it comes to Iran and this whole notion of crises, what, I mean, going back to the Clinton administration, if not before, it's always the crisis no one sees coming. And we have Mahmoud Abbas, chairman of the Palestinian Authority in his 13th year of his four-year presidential term, 82 years old, chain smoker, no vice presidential nominee. We have the supreme leader of Iran being treated for cancer and being photographed as such. What happens if that transition doesn't go smoothly? And so I do think that 
what we do have to worry about is as the state control starts to erode and frazzle, an overreaction within the state to rally people around that nationalist flag. And that is what I would argue we're seeing now rather than the collapse yeah. of the state. Yeah, system. and you asked about Israel. I know you want to interject. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I go there regularly. I used to live over there. And my last <laughs> visit, I said this at a recent forum, it's a miracle what, what is happening there and what has happened there. And for all of our talk of state collapse, whatever happens on the Palestinian side, and I can offer my prediction, I think there's not enough coherence uh, on the Palestinian side, and there's a crisis of legitimacy in, under Abbas. And yes, Israelis are grumpy about, uh, many of them, about their current leadership, but it's a system that actually is thriving, an economy that actually is connected to the global system, and it's a state that I think will remain, in part because of the forcefulness of ideas and the people that are there. Um, and, and, you know, I think we get, we, we get blindsided by missing this basic fact that, yes, there are a lot of challenges inside of Israel, but I don't see it uh, eroding in any sort of way, in part because of it's an open democratic system where people have a belief in, in the idea of what it is. And what I was suggesting, and, and the need to project that and protect it, and what I'm suggesting is that we've lost a bit of that ourselves here in the United States and how we defend and protect our values at home and in the world. That. Well, each of our speakers uh, earlier expressed a desire, even eagerness, to get into a Q&A session with you. And the Buckley uh, authorities have suggested this would be a good time to do it. So <laughs> I'll go around with the, uh, with the microphone. It doesn't make noise, but it is recording. Can I just ask that everyone says who they are and um, like if they're at Yale, what they're studying, and if they're not at Yale, what, what they do? Hi, um, I'm Tess Thompson. I'm a senior here uh, studying political science. Um, I'm just curious from both of you what um, the deal, getting back to the Iran nuclear deal, uh, the fact that we made a deal with a hostile power that um, we had had um, really diplomatic relationships with for a while. Um, if if Trump pulls out of that, what does that say to the international community about like our credibility um, in diplomacy and um, and yeah. It, it, um, it will isolate us. I mean, my view, even his gesture of this trick on decertification and, and essentially abdicating the responsibility of the presidency and trying to kick it to a Congress that actually hasn't done anything meaningful in its first nine or ten months has already sent a signal, and countries have already reacted. It's a signal that we're taking our ball and going home, and this has happened on multiple fronts in the international arena, whether it's trade uh, or climate, and other things. We're, we're isolating ourselves and reducing our influence. The second thing I'd say is that I actually think potentially, and I'm not uh, so Pollyannish about the possibility of a, a deal diplomatically with North Korea on its nuclear program, but if we go down this path on the Iran nuclear deal at this time of a crisis, it actually reduces our credibility. I'm not saying just with the regime, with our allies, with our partners in Asia, uh, with uh, our, our competitors uh, like China, uh, they're not going to believe our word. And because, you know, in, in fact, this is a president who certified the deal <laughs> the, uh, the first couple of times and now decided not to do this, people see through it. They see it as some sort of uh, silly trick that has actually made America power, American power, which I think is much more meaningful in this context of a P5 plus one. Uh, and secured a deal, not perfect, agree with the problems, agree we need to correct those problems. This is not the path pathway to correct uh, sunset issues and things like this. It's, it's a way of actually making our voice, uh, America's voice, and trying to correct those issues less meaningful in, in, in any renegotiation. I mean, on one hand, I agree with what Brian says. I don't think walking away from the deal, even though that's not what Donald Trump did, um, would be without impact on America's reputation in the world. I'm not Pollyanna-ish, as some Republicans can be in Congress. And also, just for full context, um, context, I'm a proud Republican, but I'm also a never-Trumper. I signed one of the letters opposing him, and I stood by it. I didn't forget I signed it and seek a job. I, I disagree with the president <laughs> on, um, well, Washington is a swamp, um, um, quite literally, um, at any rate. The, the issue here is many of the arguments which Brian is making were also made during the Clinton presidency when Congress um, created the Iran-Libya Sanctions Act, which imposed extraterritorial sanctions 
on European companies doing business in Iran. And even though when we look at sanctions, multilateral sanctions have more legitimacy, whatever that means, the most effective sanctions have been the Clinton administration's executive orders, the Iran-Libya Sanctions Act, and then under Bush and President Obama, some of the financial sanctions which were unilateral. People may not like it, but we need to recognize that everyone who's approaching the deal isn't approaching the deal in, in, order, to, um, in order to deny Iran a nuclear weapons capability. For the Europeans, this all started in 1993 under Foreign Minister Klaus Kinkel and the so-called critical engagement in which he basically wanted to show that the European way of diplomacy, the multilateralism and so forth, beat the U.S. cowboy unilateralism. And uh, the Iran file, of course, was the first file the European Union took the lead on outside of Europe itself. And so Europe is looking at it in, in this term. We are looking at it in terms of strategic untenability for Iran to develop nuclear weapons. Others are looking in terms of just commercial opportunities and so forth. Um, the problem is in Congress. The problem is when Donald Trump sends this to Congress, he's not telling Congress what Congress should do and give directions or guidance. It's the buck stops with everyone else instead of with me. But why is Trump in a position to decertify this deal? This isn't under terms of the Joint Conference of Plan of Action. Yeah, yeah. This is under terms of the corker card and compromise. And compromises in Congress have consequence. They don't disappear. What I would say is on a deal like this, it's important to treat it, I mean, in the future. It's too late now. We can't redo the past. But there's a reason why our founding fathers created a mechanism for treaties, ratifying treaties the way they did, yeah. rather than even as an agreement, the Congress was voting not to disapprove. Yeah. And, and, and so this is uh, what we're seeing now is the result of kicking the can down the road. Now, if we could do do-overs or, or what, what ifs, I mean, had the previous administration said, we have to get this through Congress, it would have actually made it a much, um, it would have given leverage in negotiations, which unfortunately had been forfeited. Yeah, I mean, I, if I can say, I agree with that. I think one unfortunate consequence of how the Obama administration approached the JCPOA is that when Obama officials went before Congress in uh, 2014 and 15 to talk about the deal or potential deal, um, and early as it was going, they sounded more like Iran's lawyer um, and trying to defend Iran rather than using the concerns that people in Congress had as leverage at the negotiating table. Uh, I, I do think we probably could have gotten a, a much better deal, but we are where we are now, right? Yeah. And, and what I see in a Trump administration that hasn't yet even issued implementing orders for sanctions that were passed this summer on Russia and uh, even on Iran for its destabilizing activities, what I see is a lot of bluster and rhetoric that isn't followed up on in terms of meaningful action. What I see, you know, is this passive appeasement of a lot of our adversaries in the world. And it sounds like a partisan statement, but it's not. I, I would say this of a Clinton or whatever administration if it were doing this as, as well. And, and what I, I fear is that as a consequence of how we're operating, uh, right now, it, it will tend to reduce our influence and power. I, I just want to uh, very quickly push back on what you said a little bit on North Korea, but I think the issue that the United States hasn't addressed in a bipartisan fashion, and Brian knows this well because during the Obama administration, Brian got an appointment to be a UN delegate focusing on Libya, is the whole episode of making a deal with Libya and then attacking Libya created a disincentive. That that to me is a much greater problem in terms of American diplomacy going uh -huh. forward than um, whatever Trump's doing with regard to Iran right now. Hello, my name is Samuel. I'm an MD here at Yale. I'm from Switzerland. Uh, I have a question regarding um, the, the objectives of uh, US strategy and also the legitimacy. Because, um, so you say it's not for oil. Uh, or not for economical reason, uh, I have my doubts. You say it's for, um, for ideological and moral reasons, and I think this is very, very... What, what is for? The intervention and, uh, of the U.S. You say it's not for oil or No, I said Iran was acting ideologically, yeah, and not morally. I think Germany is acting um, for commercial reasons. And so, ideologically, uh, I was wondering what is the... Um, it's more like a vision as a European 
what's the legitimacy of, of the US to, to, to act as a moral actor or a, a peacemaker in, in Middle East after all the disaster that has, that has that happened, like su supporting rebels in, uh, in Syria, or for example, uh, in Lib what happened in Libya, also, it's also the, co the, the fault of Europe too, but or on which base can you, can you self-proclaim America as a, as a policeman for, for Middle East, and if there is good reason for this? That, that would be my first question. And, and my second question would be, when you say that we have to confront ideology of Iran, I think, I think this, is, this, is, this is a good thing, but, but then there is other ideology that, that might be confronted, I think. Like when we look at ISIS or when we look, when we look at Saudi Arabia, that, uh, that the first ally, one of the first allies um, of America after Israel. I think Israel is the only really legitimate ally in the region, but when you look at Saudi Arabia, what the, what the treatment is, is reserved for homosexuals or for women, um, even for religious minorities, um, how how this is not a, a treat for for the for the region and for and for the world, and also you last when you spoke about Hezbollah, um, yes, it's a, it's considered a terrorist uh, organization. That's true, but uh, when you speak with Lebanese people, they were quite happy uh, Hezbollah defending the border against uh, against ISIS during the, the the Syrian war. So um, there is all this 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 question I have, and I would like to have your opinion, maybe. Yeah. Um, just in, in short, I'm just trying to remember this. The first one was about the U.S. acting as a world policeman. The third one was about uh, Hezbollah. Hezbollah. The, the second one was confronting Iran's ideology, was and, it? And Saudi Arabia. And Saudi Arabia. Arabia. Okay, let yeah. me tackle the second one first. Um, basically, I don't think the United States should be caught in an either-or situation. Um, look, we need to look at the reality of Saudi Arabia's uh, corrosive policy through time, but we should be supporting the moderates against the extremists of both sides. I would argue practically, since 2003-2004, not 9-11, but since 2003-2004, when Saudi Arabia started experiencing blowback on its own soil, it got much more serious about countering some of this extremism. Now, there's also the question about when one is angry with a country like Saudi Arabia for what they've done, whether or not it's wiser to um, pursue correction of that through maintenance of relations or whether one should storm away and whether or not that decreases leverage. With regard to the first question, um, I would, look, I recognize the hypocrisy of American actions at times, but I would argue that no one else is in a position, um, the United Nations is impotent when it comes to this, and when it comes to others, um, I would simply say better the United States than China, Russia, or Iran. That said, ideally we'd get into a situation where we don't need to worry about that, but I'm not going to fall over my sword saying that there's not hypocrisy or arbitrariness in this. I would simply argue that since World War II, the post-war order has been liberal and it's under assault right now. I mean, liberal Europe and America, uh, it's under assault right now as Russia, as China, as Iran, for ideological reasons, try to cast doubt on our confidence. And as Brian and I, I think Brian and I agree that there's a dangerous lack of confidence in the United States right now. With regard to Hezbollah, I don't want to be in a situation, well, let me put it this way. One can say that Lebanese are grateful um, that Hezbollah defined their, defended their border, but if we go back a little bit further, Israel withdrew in 2000. When Hezbollah claimed it was a resistance movement and in 2008 turned its guns on fellow Lebanese in the center of Beirut over a revenue sharing dispute um, with regard to the international airport there, that raised a lot of red flags. Likewise, as people are dying uh, in Syria, their families are starting to question just what they're dying for um, when we talk about Hezbollah fighting inside Syria. I've been to Melita, and I'm not sure, have you been to Melita in southern Lebanon? Mm -hmm. When you go into the caves, this is sort of like the Hezbollah Museum, and supposedly they're frozen in time from um, when the Israeli withdrew happened, withdrawal happened, I guess, in May of 2000. Um, you see the big pictures of the Ayatollah Khomeini and Ayatollah Khamenei. For me, a picture tells a thousand words, and Hezbollah is increasingly having a hard time pretending to be a nationalist organization more broadly. Yeah, I, let me just add one thing and so we can get other questions. I, the U.S. is not going to be the world's policeman, and I, I think actually 
we're no longer aspiring to do so. We never were an effective one at that, but we did uh, serve as the only global power that did keep the global commons o open, and, and we, we play that role. What I would say in the Middle East is, and, and this is what I've written about a lot, is that the U.S. has far more leverage uh, and a, a broader network of partners in the region than any other country outside of the region. Nobody in Europe has it. China still to this day doesn't. Russia, though it's punched far above its weight uh, in Syria and is trying in, in other places since 2015, does not have the ability to and capacity to shape an influence. And I want to uh, highlight shape and influence because it should be the region itself that should determine uh, the outcomes. But that doesn't mean that we should be passive in doing that in the way that I think President Obama was passive in the wake of the Arab Spring um, and in some ways made some bad judgment calls in reacting uh, to this. And especially by the time we reached 2013 and the coup in Egypt and the counter wave against it, America's voice was uh, fairly silent. America was not, uh, presence was non-existent on Syria, one of the biggest travesties. And we, I don't know why we don't even debate this uh, because of the, the human, humanitarian and strategic <laughs> costs. But the thing that I would say going forward, and it probably won't happen for the next three years because I have no faith in this presidency as one that is actually serious about engaging in the world, but I think it's still there, that people in the region, whether it's our allies and close allies like Israel, or frenemies uh, <laughs> that, that we work with um, on security issues or counterterrorism fights, they look to us first and foremost. They may sign deals with Russia uh, and economic measures, but they still look to the United States. And what I think we failed at doing, and this is not a Democratic or Republican thing, is that we've not effectively projected our power and influence and used our leverage to actually lead to peaceful outcomes. We haven't helped resolve conflicts in Yemen or Syria or even the Arab-Israeli conflict. And it's because of this underinvestment um, in an integrated approach to power. Um, we used to call it smart power uh, 10 years ago. Um, um, and nobody really talks about that. And in fact, what we're seeing in the State Department under President uh, Trump is the decimation of the career ranks, 60%, I think it was, of senior diplomats gone. Uh, we don't even talk about those sorts of things. So my ideal is that, yes, the U.S. can play some sort of role on, on all of these fronts. We have so many capable people who have served our country in, in diplomatic and other roles and actually serve in such, with such good intent that, yes, as Michael said, is not how Russia <laughs> or, or China approaches these, these countries. But we've never truly elevated those components. We've had a very militarized approach which, and I say that not as a pacifist, we need our military and we need to use it, but it needs to be integrated in ways that produce outcomes. We did it in the 1990s in places like the former Yugoslavia, where we actually helped, I think, at least uh, forestall a bigger uh, crisis, a little too late in some instances. But we've basically, I think, uh, over the last several years, and this will likely continue, we've taken our ball and we've gone home and allowed others to shape the field. Uh, hey, is it on? Um, uh, my name is Kareem. I'm from Lebanon. Uh, I'm a first year MA student at the Jackson Institute for Global Affairs. Uh, I have two questions. Actually, one of them is uh, well, it's something you talked about, which is that uh, Lebanon or your allies in Lebanon are not doing enough to counter the ideology of Iran, and there's much more things that can be done. What exactly are you waiting or expecting from them, given that? the public opinion in Lebanon, especially the anti-Hezbollah public opinion is losing support. Yeah. Uh, not because they're suddenly liking Hezbollah, but because they're losing faith yeah. in their allies, especially in the United States, what the United States can do to us if Iran attacks or whatever. Yeah. Uh, my second question is, how do you read the recent uh, developments in Lebanon? Do you see it turning violent? Do you see a war on the horizon? And do you envision a role for Israel in that conflict? Yeah, let, let, me, um, let me start first, and then Michael can add. Uh, on the first part, and I, I approach this always with humility, since you're uh, from Lebanon and you know the country. We went there for a week. I go there once a year, maybe. 
Uh, we follow it and talk to people. We met with your former prime minister, Hariri in Beirut, and then if, or wh wherever he is. I don't know where he is right now. Anyone know where uh, Saad is? Um, um, and saw him recently when he came to see President Trump um, in Washington. Um, the, the thing that impresses me the most when I go to Lebanon is there is this diversity of voices and this pluralism that doesn't really exist in many parts of the Middle East, and it's because of the the nature of sort of the society and you know the different communities that are there. And as Michael, I think, said earlier on, it's not all about us and America, but I do think that our voice has been non-existent in places like Lebanon where there are more progressive visions, there are alternatives, there are, and I hate using these categories of sectarian, uh, you know, Shiites that are dissident and don't like Hezbollah, but we don't support them. Um, nobody actually support, helps them help themselves, nor do we actually, you know, Beirut and Medinity. We met with the civil society and others who were trying to raise the voice of people who were just frustrated about trash, right? And we talked to, all, I think, most of the Lebanese political leadership when we were there for our joint project. And, and a lot, I think the attitude was dismissive amongst, about this new generation of voices. And if the U.S. is cutting sort of State Department, and it's not even what our governments can do, it's what our, our communities and our society and our institutions can do to actually help foster those little flames of pluralism and forward-looking ideas. We don't even talk about it because somehow in this country we've come to equate that type of engagement with the Iraq war or with drone strikes and other things. And I think we need a richer discussion about a full spectrum U.S. engagement that isn't simply just about the military or what the CIA does. And how do we engage complex societies like Lebanon where there are so many voices that actually want to push back? I think what we can do, and I was actually talking to you, um, his boss yesterday about this, is there are things that we could do to actually take Hezbollah down a peg that, I, you know, that many of their actors are murderous thugs. They're thieves and have stolen a lot of money and taken money. Uh, expose this uh, and help actors on the ground expose this, but then protect them too. As you know, Hezbollah gets bitten, they bite back. And we actually, the Cedar Revolution <laughs> from 11 years ago, um, we, we didn't think of a, a better way to engage, uh, uh, I think, on that front. When it comes to what happens next in Lebanon, I, I am, I'm disinclined to predict. I wrote an article with a colleague yesterday, I think, in the New Republic about what happened in Saudi Arabia. And we touched upon Lebanon a little bit. But I'm the type of analyst where I, I'm not certain I know enough and haven't talked enough uh, to, to people uh, in the region to venture a guess, and, and my friends in Lebanon, because uh, my guess, the only thing I can say is what I do know based on my trip to Israel uh, two weeks ago, where I met with a lot of the top security establishment, mostly it was focused on uh, talking to the intelligence and military. And my sense was they, they don't want a return to 2006, to, you know, what happened then. That since then, they, uh, the collective uh, uh, that I took away from it, um, view, again, against security professionals, generals, people in the intelligence, is that they have a, a deterrence that's been in place um, uh, with a little bit of attrition when they see weapons being transferred from Syria and Iran to Hezbollah. But to, to upset that at this moment um, uh, would actually not be good for Israel's own interests. That leaves me a little bit more hopeful. Now, our, our former ambassador, Dan Shapiro, uh, who's still in Tel Aviv, Assam, he wrote an article for Haaretz a, a couple of days ago who talked about how maybe this is Saudi Arabia trying to push Israel into a war with Iran and, and Lebanon. I feel like it's a little far-fetched. Um, maybe some of the political leadership in Israel would like to see that because they're deeply concerned about what Iran's doing in Syria and how the U.S. has been passive and not really present uh, in any way. And the week that I was there, the Russian defense minister was coordinating uh, with, with Israel and vice versa, not, not the U.S., you know, and that's amazing to me that Israel feels the need to go to Russia, but it is what it is. But back to the broader point is that I, if anything, uh, I feel like the pragmatism among the, <laughs> the Israeli security establishment of they know the risks and the uncertainties that would be involved in some sort of conflict with Hezbollah would uh, serve as some sort of uh, stabilizing uh, factor in all of this. If, uh -oh. Okay, sorry. Very good. Um, I would just second Brian uh, in terms of predicting the future. 
the one thing I learned after getting a PhD here at Yale is as a historian, I predict the past, and admittedly, I only get that right about half the time. <laughs> um, with regard to the first part of your question, um, I would say that's an illustration of everyone rallying around the strong horse, rather whether or not they want to be. So then the question comes, as you say, how do you bring Hezbollah down a peg? When I'm in Lebanon, um, and I, I spend a lot of the time in the Shiite world. I mean, I've every year or every other year, I go as a, a guest of the um, the chief of staff of Grand Ayatollah Sistani to Nejef and Karbala, and I spend a lot of time just in the Shiite world. At, because of um, the legacy of my PhD dissertation here and so forth. The point is, most Shiites I hear in Lebanon, when they're talking about Hezbollah, they talk about it in terms of being a mafia group, rather more than anything else. Um, I mean, in their daily life, the problem's not Israel, the problem's not someone else. If there are Shiite businessmen in southern Beirut, they don't like having the extortion that they have to face. Um, one of the the nice thing about being in a think tank is I get to work in the world of policy rather than politics. And therefore, I don't, and, and Brian is the same way, we don't have to focus on the day-to-day -day political debates. As a, if I put on my historian cap, I think one of the biggest U.S. mistakes was for the sake of short-term quiet in 2008 when Dr. Rice, Condoleezza Rice, acquiesced to the Doha Accord, which gave Hezbollah a veto-proof majority because it put Hezbollah in a position where they could um, veto everything, but they didn't need the accountability of actually governing. They could be a permanent spoiler. Now, when it comes to undercutting Hezbollah, I mean, Lebanon has recently gone through its electoral reform and so forth, and it's been more horse trading than anything else. But why does Hezbollah win big in the South? Is it because people like Hezbollah? Not necessarily. It's because people have to vote in their ancestral homeland. And if Hezbollah knows, if you live in Beirut and Hezbollah knows how your family's going to vote, they're not physically going to let you go down and vote. Likewise, with some of the gerrymandering we've seen, that too is, is a nonviolent aspect which could be reversed to, um, to, to empower that more tolerant middle. Um, but with that, and with regard to Israel, the one thing... I largely agree with Brian's analysis. The one thing which I think is keeping um, things in check, the dangerous aspect is Michel Aoun, the president, being in the position he's in because it makes what was a Hezbollah problem into a whole Lebanon problem just with Michel Aoun's uh, embrace of Hezbollah, if you will, even though he's, a, as you know, a Christian politician. Um, if Israel and Iran were ever to come to blows, the, lead, the deterrence upon Israel from Iran would be Hezbollah's missiles. Now, if Hezbollah precipitates, or if Lebanon precipitates a war with Israel in which those missiles are launched, it's conceivable that Israeli policymakers would say, well, as long as we're suffering this reign of Hezbollah missiles, then the th threshold or the cost to acting more forcefully against Iran's nuclear program has reduced all the more significantly. So in effect, there's a deterrence on Lebanon right now which didn't exist previously. I don't know whether that's going to hold because again, all it takes is some, I won't even say rogue, I mean I, I study Iranian decision making. Now the supreme leader of Iran's a dictator, but he's not a dictator like Saddam Hussein was or Kim Jong-un is. He's a di dictator by veto power. He'll tell you what you're not allowed to do, but whatever he hasn't expressly forbidden, you're able to do, which means, for example, in 2006, when American policymakers said, did Iran give the order for Hezbollah to launch this operation? The response is no, there's going to be no smoking gun in the signals intelligence because Iran is only going to tell people what they can't do. The point of this is I have no idea whether the Iranians have told Hezbollah what the Iranian red line is, and that makes it a very dangerous situation right now. Thanks.